So Dearer Than Hansen was a movie. A movie musical, a spectacle for the ages. But maybe just not at all for the reasons they wanted it to be. A cinematic experience that asks the question, can we take a 27 year old man who's recently played a convincing high schooler and make him look 35, but then still stick him in a high school setting? And the answer is yes. Cause they did it. After their son Connor ended his life, a family comes across Evan, a boy who may have been his only friend. As they struggle to find answers why, Evan becomes a staple in their home. Essentially becoming the stand-in for the son that they lost. But Evan has a secret. He didn't really know Connor and he's secretly in love with their daughter. Sounds like a thriller, right? Maybe even a horror, but no. But it's supposed to be a heartwarming tale of championing the outsiders and mental health awareness. Because comes a literal nightmare with slightly different framing. And that is why Dear Evan Hansen is such an interesting thing to talk about. I kind of had a blast with it. It put me through the emotional ringer. But this has also clearly had a lot of positive impact on people over the years. Seeing as this movie tries to give them more of a redemption arc, they knew there was something wrong with the original delivery. But before we hop into this work of art, we got a message from today's returning sponsor, Likewise. Look, Likewise loves me and I love Likewise because they are the best place to discover new media. Like maybe you're bad at picking something to watch amongst all the different streaming services, or maybe you specifically want to watch something that is similar to what you already love. With Likewise, whether you're looking for shows, movies, books, or even podcasts, they'll use the subjects, themes, and specific titles you're interested in to recommend you new media with smart technology and real user recommendations. In my line of work, I always have something to watch, but there's still things that manage to fly under my radar, and I am terrible at keeping up with shows, and Likewise has me covered. But what I really tend to struggle with is picking the next book to read, and Likewise has been great for that. The only issue I have is that I end up with so many great recommendations that I then have to go to the trouble of picking one from the great recommendations. And the recommendations themselves are accurate. I obviously can't list every piece of media I've ever consumed in my life, but if it recommends me something I've already watched, I did like it. Every day you get a personalized list of recommendations you can swipe through, and if you find something you like, it's super easy to save it for later so you never have to keep track yourself, and it'll even let you know what streaming service it's on. You can also make lists of things you'd recommend for other users to see. Uh, if you want to check out my list of movies that I saw at the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival, I'll have it linked down below. And if you're just hungry for more content, you can use the ask feature to request recommendations from the community and contribute to other people's threads. So if you want some sweet media recommendations and to help support this channel, head on over to on.likewise.com slash Jedi3 or click the link in the description below. It's 100% free and you can follow me there at Amanda the Jedi. So dear Evan Hansen, we are gonna start with some spoiler free thoughts or just things that you could gather from like the description of the movie, the trailer, you know, the basic stuff. So there was probably a way to make this work and they do fix some of the issues that were brought up about the Broadway show, but it's still rough. And I do really think that the people who were involved in this movie genuinely cared about the story and like the positive aspects of the story being brought to light. It was directed by Steven Shabosky, who's the author of Perks of Being a Wallflower, who also directed the Perks of Being a Wallflower movie, which is probably my favorite favorite movie that deals with like mental health issues in like teenagers. But Evan Hansen is a story about connection, the dangerous powers of social media, and at its heart, one of self-value, mental health awareness, and suicide prevention. Or at least that's what it wants to be about. At its core is just something that has a lot of issues if we're supposed to feel like we can relate to a character like Evan. I'm never gonna be someone who thinks that characters in movies have to be perfect. Like it's fun to talk about like the over-the-top dysfunctional things people do, but in a movie like this where the point isn't that spectacle, it's the message underneath. It kind of becomes an issue if you are too busy juggling like, wow, how could an 18 year old do this? And aw, I feel sympathy for this guy. Which is kind of why this story ends up being so interesting to talk about and what saves it from being like so many other things. I hope it'll be something that can start some solid conversations about mental health. I think most of the music is really good, which obviously matters because it's a musical. But by the end, it just kind of comes across as sociopathic that Evan doesn't really seem to have any conflict consequences thrust upon him for literally manipulating a family. I get that he deals with social anxiety and awkwardness, but there was definitely a way to downplay what this family's assumptions were rather than just jumping in two feet with 
fake emails and secret hangouts, but we'll get there. A lot of it does hit emotionally and I appreciate what it's trying to do and it's not like the movie is trying to tell you to do the things that Evan Hansen does. It just goes so far in a direction that I don't feel any logical person could commit to unless they were a bit of a monster. And we're definitely not supposed to walk away thinking that Evan's a monster. They could still achieve so much of what this movie is without having him go so far. I'm not gonna make fun of it for trying to get people to open up dialogue about mental health and teens and the complex issues and emotions they've faced, but I am gonna make fun of the way they did it. And to clarify, if you were someone who loves this story, if you are a fan of the Broadway show or even this movie, I'm glad I am not trying to cut for anybody's head. I really enjoyed watching this again. A lot of the times it might just not have been for the right reasons. I just have so many feelings about this movie and they all need to escape my brain. And I don't think I'm alone. It seems like it's been pretty controversial since it first started running on Broadway. There's a bunch of theater kids or just people that I follow on Twitter that hate it. And then there's like a bunch of other people who have like loved it because they've been watching it since they were like significantly younger. Like it won a bunch of Tony awards. So clearly there was already something there. And I know that this movie made choices to have more positive changes, so. Yeah, it's something. But there's aspects about it that are a bit odd. See, Ben Platt is 27, but even I could have played a more convincing high schooler than him. And I feel like it's purely based on how they chose to try to make him look younger. Ben Platt has successfully been playing a high schooler since like the age of 19. He was just a high schooler in The Politician. He played Evan Hansen for the first time when he was 22. I get that there's a difference between stage performances and a movie, but the point is, I think he still has it in him to play a high schooler as long as you put the right people around him. But they cast actors who are near him in age, but they all look younger. Nick Dadani is also 27, but looks young. Caitlin Deaver is 24, but looks super comfortable in a high school setting for movies. Amanda Stenberg is 22 and could play a ninth grader if she needed to. Something with how they tried to smooth his face with a foundation and what I assume has to be a wig just made him look like an adult trying to look like an oversized toddler. Like, I feel like I can see the foundation in his eyebrows. I just like to imagine it as this thing that everybody in the schools knows. It's like, oh yeah, that guy's like basically 30, but since his dad's the mayor and he doesn't want to get a real job, we just kind of have to let him chill. I know the fans of the musical are probably really happy that it's Ben reprising the role. I'm also pretty sure that Ben might have insisted, and I don't blame him. If I had won a Tony Award for a stage performance and had the chance to reprise the role in a movie, I would absolutely do it, no matter how many people on the internet made fun of me. I know he says that him looking old isn't an issue as long as there's no complaints in the performance or the singing, but it's not that he looks too old, it's their method of trying to make him look younger that become the issue. Yeah, he can sing and play the part, we all know that, but it's distracting. You never get used to the way he looks while you're watching the movie. It also makes this movie way more fun to talk about. I understand why it would be deeply upsetting for Ben and why he'd probably be very upset that this is the main discourse around the movie that he feels is trying to have a really serious discussion about a serious topic, but like, I'm sorry, you can't control what happens once it gets out into the internet ethos. The message is still getting out there there, or we're just also making fun of it. The style, not the message. This is probably gonna turn into a cult classic. I would love to turn this into some audience-fueled event with the proceeds being donated to different mental health initiatives. Which brings me to something that I meant to mention earlier. I'm gonna be making a donation to the Kids Help Phone with uh, ad revenue from uh, this video. They helped me a lot growing up and I feel like it aligns really well with the message of this movie. So I feel like if I'm gonna make fun of something that's trying to be really inspirational for teens and mental health awareness, like I should put some money up. Other details though, I think they did a really good job with most of the music in this. The choreography where it was present was super fun. I genuinely loved Sincerely Me. Like I can see myself like putting that on, on, on my phone and like listening to it in the car and stuff. Like I like it a lot. You need Jared Gay in this though. So the nipple rubbing line and talking about not being gay isn't as weird now, right? Right? It's so unhinged, I love it. I think the performances were mostly really good. Colton Ryan made Connor's pain really palpable while he was in it, and Caitlin Deaver also really stood out to me. Amy Adams seems like she was still channeling a little bit from Woman in the Window, and holy shit, Julianne Moore was in that too. Do they have like the same age? Anyways, I'm gonna be going full spoilers with this one, so if you wanna watch the movie first, do that, then come back, otherwise strap in. So it starts with our lead boy writing a letter to himself, which is an assignment from his therapist to give himself a pep talk. 
talk. A therapist I will mention does not appear in this movie once and definitely could have helped with most of the problems, but that's where the title comes from. He also has a broken arm that he says he got while working with park rangers and no one came to find him for like a really long time. It's quite sad. But we're immediately shown that Evan is quite the bit of an outsider. He doesn't really have any friends. He's awkward and honestly, the only person he talks to is someone who clarifies that he's a family friend, not an actual friend. We're family friends, Evan. Please respect that. He's the type of person that gets too worked up to even begin having a conversation with other people, even if they approach him first. And it's not just that he doesn't fit in, it's that he seems to be anguishing over so many aspects of being alive. And if Evan is ignored, Connor is antagonized. Connor, I'm loving this manicure. It's very school shooter chic. And when Evan tries to like give him a sympathy smile, Connor assumes that he was laughing at him and yells in his face. And stop laughing! Two misunderstood people in very different ways. They also really want you to know that Evan has a huge crush on this girl, Zoe, who happens to be Connor's sister, who rocks up after Connor yells in Evan's face and he is so unable to talk to her that he Naruto runs away from the situation. Oh, Evan, the struggle. <laughs> so he heads to the library to work on another Dear Evan Hansen letter. And this one is the opposite of the hopeful one we started with. Any hopes he had for a good day or a positive start to the school year just go out the window, even Nick, Family friend won't sign his cast. But if you're writing a super serious therapy letter to yourself about having a crush on someone who you've never really talked to and uh, a bunch of other stuff, why would you both type it up on a school computer and then print it off in a busy school setting? Setting yourself up for disaster, which happens a couple times in this, honestly. So I think Connor felt bad for snapping and actually tries to make nice with Evan until he notices that that letter talks about his sister and thinks that it was Evan trying to bait him into some kind of freak out. Now Evan is obviously paranoid that Connor's gonna share the letter with everyone, but something even worse happens. Connor ends up killing himself later that night with the letter Evan wrote still in his pocket. And that's the angle this story doesn't seem to explore that I find the most heartbreaking. Connor, who will go on to be told has been troubled for years, has had a failed suicide attempt in the past, has been to rehab, has a rocky relationship with everyone in his family, actually seemed to be making one moment of effort, maybe one moment to try try to turn things around and thought he was being set up, then took his own life. That's what I keep thinking about in this story that it never goes back to. I'm not even remotely implying that it's Evan's fault. You can't control how someone's gonna react to something that they were never supposed to see and had nothing to do with them. And you also can't control what other people's actions are gonna be. But it doesn't change the impact. If I was in Evan's shoes, that definitely would have been my first thought and would have caused me the most distress. But because a letter titled Dear Evan Hansen was found in Connor's pocket, his family assumes that it was for Evan. Meaning they believe that Evan was Connor's only friend, that this is the only thing he left behind as an indication of why he might have done it. And he sucks at speaking up for himself, so the more Amy Adams is looking at him with those eyes and those assumptions, the less he can bring himself to clarify after they bring up that Connor took his life. He even manages to get the words, Connor didn't write this out of his mouth. I'm sorry, Connor didn't write this. But then they keep saying that it's the only thing he left behind. He didn't leave any other notes or explanations or letters to anyone. And then once the mom sees the cast, it's pretty much all over. But there was still a way to downplay this, say, hey, we weren't really friends, but he was the only person who made an effort to come up to me and sign my cast. He felt like someone I could have been friends with. But that wouldn't make way for this plot enough. Actually, you could probably still make it work. It just wouldn't be as dramatic. It just seems like there's a lot of distance between I wrote that letter for therapy and here's a bunch of fake emails between Connor and I that I wrote to give you a false sense of peace. I'm also gonna sing a song that makes it seem more like we were in a secret relationship, not a secret friendship, but in actuality, I'm in love with your daughter that I've never spoken to. I mean, they think you're a lover, so you realize that, right? Oh my God. A bit of this as a white lie still would have sucked, but would have offered a bit of peace to a grieving family. But the extent he dove in prevented them from looking for people who might have actually had a friendship with Connor or actually had experiences with him. But I also feel bad for someone who felt so lonely that they had to make up a fake friendship with a dead boy just to feel like they belong. He doesn't only feel alone at school, but at home too. His mom loves him, but she's a nurse and she's taking a bunch of extra shifts so she can make sure to provide for them and help him with 
at college. His dad walked out when he was young and doesn't want anything to do with him. So when this new place was carved out for him in the Murphy family, he took it. Not remotely okay in the way that it happens, but I understand why it was so easy to fall into once it was started. But as they're programming out these fake emails, we get the Sincerely Me song. Cause all that it takes is a little which is probably my favorite song of the movie, but it's also a little bit morbid because Connor is dead. But I watched the musical and Connor and Evan talk a lot more after Connor dies in the musical and this movie cuts most of it out. Movie probably still needs a little bit of reinvention, pals. But Jared here is also a horrible person for not only helping him lie, but also programming a bunch of fake emails so that it actually looked like they were sent. That's where the whole thing just escalates way too much. It's horrible. I was not remotely expecting that to be the direction this went in when I sat down in the theater. Because things were rough behind the scenes for Connor and his family. Zoe has memories of him taking advantage of her for money and was a bit afraid of him. The dad felt he gave Connor every chance and opportunity and he just lashed back violently. And it's really only the mom looking to hold on to the best ideas of who he used to be and maybe who he secretly was. Because the family's wealthy, she's home all day. The only thing she really had to worry about was being a mom. So it gives her a lot more time to stew in it. And she's always gonna remember who he was. But I get more angry at him when this Alana girl comes up and says that she found Connor to be pretty remarkable after they worked on a project together because he didn't care what people thought of him. And that's something she does worry about, so she valued it. That's a real story that could have brought his family some joy. To know he had some kind of positive impact on somebody who wasn't the kid lying about a friendship. But hell, even Evan's real story about Connor wanting to sign his cast could have brought them some peace. Like maybe not the part where he says, now we can both pretend we have friends, but still. It also gets really weird when he sings a song to Zoe that's supposed to be all the things that Connor noticed about her, even though they never really talked and it's actually just all the things that Evan notices about her, but Evan's secretly in love, so it feels odd. I love you. Tell me that isn't scary to be sung as if it's the brother. <laughs> And they almost kissed at the end of that. In no world, no shot. This is kind of extra messed up considering how abusive Zoe and Connor's sibling relationship actually was. But the movie makes a point to show that if Evan could just get out of his own way a little bit, he could actually make friendships because he's not as weird as he believes he is. Alana opens up to him about also being on medication, that a lot of people at school feel the same way and go through the same issues, even if it doesn't seem like it. Like she's the kind of person who needs to constantly be doing something, otherwise she would actually have to stop and, and think about some of those problems she's dealing with. And this whole situation inspired her to create a memorial event and try to find ways to get the school involved so kids have a place they can reach out if they need help. It's great and segues into one of those added songs, the anonymous ones. And it definitely steps in to make the whole thing feel like more genuine concern versus keeping the memory alive for the sake of keeping the memory alive. It replaces the song Disappear where Evan seems more concerned that if people forget Connor, they'll forget him too. And when you lay it out like that, it sounds really bad, but the song itself seems to be about how everyone has value and is worth being remembered, which is true and nice. Then the social media beast enters the movie. You get all the feeders right after it happened, like the same people that were bullying him at the beginning of the movie are taking selfies with his locker, which is tragically something that actually happens. Just stop, don't be that way. But because Connor's mom expects Evan to say something at the memorial, she even gives him Connor's tie to wear. It makes way for his emotional song to go viral. It's actually a speech, but it's a musical, so it's a song. It's fine, you get it. Complete with his best friend committed suicide. You won't believe what he did next because that's the internet. And what he does next is sing a song that everyone can relate to. And when you're broken on the ground, you will be found. This whole song feels weird because it's basically Evan rewriting his own personal tragedy. He wasn't found when he was broken on the ground, but neither was Connor. But when it comes to the lasting effect, that doesn't really matter. Him imagining how he wishes things could have been is helping people, letting them know that they're not alone. But when Evan starts talking about what Connor gave them all, it feels gross. And I think in some ways that might have been the point. I just don't know if the movie does enough to make the point. Like people using the situation for social credit or for personal projects and personal gain. That's what both Evan and Alana are doing. So when this song ends with people all over the world singing and talking about how much the message helped them or their kids, it turns into a mosaic of Connor's face, which I thought was a 
horrible touch. But this is the moment where Zoe and the dad seem to have their emotional breakthrough with Connor's death and how he affected some kind of positive change in the world. They basically feel like Evan gave them the Connor they remembered back and managed to keep his legacy alive. But now Evan is hot shit. He's got a ton of Instagram followers. He has friends at school. They're working on a fundraiser to get the apple orchard Connor loved back up and running. And even if he's stressed by how deep he's in, life is good. Cause Zoe, Zoe likes him, which is easily the most unbelievable part of this movie. They have solid, you are my brother's only friend chemistry, but they have zero romantic chemistry and it feels so weird. I don't need you to sell me on reasons to want you. Are you sure about that, Zoe? Because I need to be sold. Some people think that this was part of his grand plan to get close to the family so we could end up with her, but I think it was just a happy accident. I get it. He's essentially gaslit her emotions by conflating the positive feelings she wishes she could have shared with her brother with him. But they get so caught up in their little life that Evan starts lying to his mom about always being over at the Murphy house, not showing up to the meetings for the Connor project, because he's a little bit too busy working on the Zoe project, which can only mean disaster is about to drop. See, when I say the Connors family started seeing Evan like a son, I mean they want to use the money they put aside for Connor to go to college for Evan to go to college. And Julianne Moore kind of snaps and is very upset because they're seeing him as a pseudo son and she didn't even realize that he had been spending any amount of time there. He'd even kept up the lie of not knowing Connor with her for a really long time, so this is just completely blindsiding her. I feel like a lot of her emotions stem from her feeling like she can't be around as much and maybe feeling inadequate about not being able to give him more and maybe being a little bit offended that this other family seems to think she can't like take care of him and then also being able to give him so much more than she can. Sorry, I can't give you anything more than that. It's not my fault if other people can. Oof, Evan, I get it, but still. And then Alana kind of catches on that aspects of Evan's story aren't quite adding up. Were you ever actually friends with him? He said he broke his arm in June with Connor, but he didn't have a cast at the time. So to convince her that he isn't lying, he sends her the Dear Evan Hansen letter, which to everyone else was Connor's suicide letter. And instead of just showing it to her on his phone or something, he actively sends it to her and is like, but don't show anybody, right? But when she realizes that the campaign is slowing down and probably isn't gonna get enough funds, she posts the letter online to give it a boost. So the internet, being the internet, flips on the family for a few reasons. They feel like they obviously should have known that Connor was essentially crying out for help. And then it's gross that a rich family is asking for money online for an apple orchard when they could have funded the whole thing themselves. The internet is a sick place. Though I will say that $100,000 for an apple orchard, even if that was his favorite place as a kid and it's a place that his parents can find peace while visiting seems like a bit much. 100K to a crisis hotline, to mental health organizations, or even just to individually fund people in the school to get therapy would have been way more impactful. But once it goes live, the family starts tearing themselves apart, blaming the therapy programs Connor was in, blaming each other. So Evan finally comes clean. He didn't write it. We weren't friends. And oh God, he started singing. Words fail. Words fail. I get that it's a musical, but it's really fun to imagine that he just started singing to try to make them not be as mad. They obviously tell him to leave, which brings us to the Evan Hansen redemption arc, which uh, isn't much of anything. I will say that he's the one who tells the truth online. So like not even just the school, but everyone in the world that's following him knows, which he gets bonus points for, but I'm surprised he didn't like get expelled or something. I also think he would have been bullied to shit, not just glared at in the cafeteria. If they thought Connor was a psycho, how do you think they'd feel about about the kid who lied about being his best friend so he could try to fit into his family as a pseudo son. This is where we get the big reveal. Evan broke his arm jumping out of a tree on purpose because he felt like he wanted to die, which he finally reveals to his mom and she just feels bad for not realizing how much he was hurting. Though she should probably ground him for like doing what he did to that family, but it's whatever. This was a very emotional song. I teared up, but after posting about how he lied, he does what he probably should have done from the beginning, try to learn about Connor. He ends up coming across the list of books that he listed as loving in the yearbook and reads them all. It doesn't mean that he actually knows him, but it's actually putting some effort into tracking down something Connor actually liked. Then he goes one step further and tries to track down anyone who might have known Connor. So he finally finds someone from Connor's recovery who happens to have a recording of him playing a song, something his mom knew he did, but had never heard. He used to write songs, or at least 
He told us he did. He refused to play for us. A real genuine final gift to the family. Cry to your two. I'm telling you, I want the full Connor story. I'm gonna cry right now. So he at least made some kind of atonement. Definitely better than the Broadway show where it just cuts from that conversation that he has with the mom right to him talking to Zoe at the end. Where after he apologizes, she's basically like, well, you know, everyone needed to lie. So it's fine. <laughs> It's so weird and bad. And that's why Inside This Movie is a really impactful story that I think was delivered much better than the Broadway show. Evan's just such a shit. He did bring them some peace, but the pain that comes the second that shoe drops leaves them worse than before the lie started. What I did, it's the worst thing anyone can do. Yes, Evan. It is the worst thing. At least she's like, yeah, yeah well, yes, it was. The final chat with the sister in the movie basically amounts to her saying like, yeah, we're not really gonna talk anymore. But she wanted him to see the one good thing that came from his elaborate lie to eject himself into the family, the orchard. But it ends with a much more confident and positive Evan Hansen, leaving us all with a message to just keep going, which is great. So in a really weird way, Connor was the one to pick Evan up off the ground. He'll just never know. I'm telling you, I want the Connor story. What a conflicting movie, truly. I guess it really all just comes down to not being able to root or relate to Evan Hansen after everything he did. I think a lot of people are really gonna enjoy this. Again, I enjoyed it uh, in a lot of ways I probably shouldn't have, but I do still feel like a lot of that emotional stuff hits. But the plot progression is really terrifying when you stop and think about it. I will make the Dear Evan Hansen horror. Here's a little bonus content. I couldn't get the idea of this being shot and filmed as a thriller out of my head, so I made a little trailer for it. Dear Evan Hansen, today is going to be an amazing day. Now we can both pretend we are friends. I'm sorry about my brother, he's... <clears throat> we didn't think Connor had any friends. Connor took his own life. Uh, Connor and I, we had a really great time together. Um, this one day recently? I thought you were gonna tell them the truth. I, I, I tried, but then I just couldn't stop. They didn't want me to stop. I've been wondering something. Were you ever actually friends with him? That's gonna do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks again to Likewise for sponsoring the video and thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. You can feel free to follow all my social medias down below if you want to. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.